I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. In early October 2022 came the dramatic yet not entirely unexpected news that Jonathan Dowdall would be a state witness in the upcoming trial of Jerry Hutch. The former Sinn Féin councillor and owner of a successful electrical business was already a familiar face to those of us who follow Irish crime. Along with his dad, Patrick Dowdall, he was jailed in 2017 after being found guilty of torturing a man he met on the trading website Dundeal, who'd agreed to buy a motorbike off him. The details of the crime, which included waterboarding, were utterly shocking, especially given his once promising political career. But that particular episode was about to pale into insignificance thanks to his decision to give evidence against one of Ireland's best-known criminals, the monk. There were whispers, of course, that Dowdall had been asking about the state witness protection programme. But many wondered if he'd really go through with it. Such a massive betrayal in a world that works and depends on omerta, the code of silence first favoured by the Italian mafia. Of course, you never talk. And you absolutely never cooperate with the police. But it would seem Dowdall was so desperate to get himself and his dad off the hook for the Regency shooting, where David Byrne was murdered by a five-man squad of assassins in February 2016, that he was willing to offer up information that could help prosecute Jerry Hutch. And as part of the deal, he and his family would disappear to another country, willing to take them and never to return. This is the story of Jerry the Monk Hutch from his early days as a young hoodlum through to his astonishing acquittal in the Special Criminal Court. How did this quiet-spoken man from the North Inner City become one of the most notorious figures in Irish criminal history? How did he end up on trial for murder? And why did he walk free? It's a story about blood bonds, bitter feuds and shocking betrayal. It's a story about the changing face of Dublin and about the pursuit of justice in the courts and on the streets. The Monk is a four-part crime world long read produced by Ian Mullaney and read by me, Nicola Talent. Part 4. Trial of the Century Opinion is mixed about whether Dowdall is intensely naive or possibly a bit stupid. Or maybe it really was the only course of action he felt he could take in the circumstances. But you'd have to wonder how familiar he was with the Irish Witness Programme, which is fairly small time, not to mention controversial. Because of a lack of legislation, the system is almost entirely self-governed by the Gardaí. First introduced here as part of the investigation into Veronica Guerin's murder, it's estimated about 20 to 30 people are currently in the programme, including some families. And as Joey O'Callaghan can tell you, there have been serious concerns about the way it's run. Joey was the youngest ever person to go into the system after he testified against Brian Kenny and Thomas Hinchin, both accused of Jonathan O'Reilly's murder outside Cloverhill Prison in April 2004. His evidence helped to jail the two men for life and at the age of 20, Joey was cut off from the only world he'd ever known. He told his harrowing tale in a book I wrote with him and then in the award-winning podcast The Witness in his own words. In it, he gave a fascinating, if grim, glimpse into the realities of the Witness Protection Programme, something Jonathan Dowdall would have been wise to do some research on before seeking to do a similar deal. But perhaps he and his family felt the alternative was far worse. To get an idea of what lies ahead for Dowdall once he's released from prison, I spoke to Maynooth University lecturer Aaron Hart Hughes, who is in the middle of completing a PhD about the Irish Witness Security Programme. He explained the significance of the lack of legislation around it, the European recommendations that are being currently ignored, and the difficulties it causes for the judges, the witnesses and the accused. 
where there is secrecy, inevitably it creates suspicion. Mm. And the general uh, utopian view of witness protection programs is that suspicion should be reduced. Now, naturally, there are inherent security concerns. And that is the, I suppose, the difficulty and the critical balance that must be struck between ensuring the security and viability of the program, but also ensuring the lawfulness and legitimacy of these programs. And the recommendation that these programs be legislated is not something new. In fact, the, the European recommendations through several reports commencing in 1997 and then going up the years in 2005, 1998, apologies, 2005, 2007, and then 2015 as well. We have seen reports whereby, now I stress it's not legislative there now, that they're not mandating that this occurs, but there is the recommendation that witness protection programs should be enforced within an adequate legal framework and that there should be legislation supporting its maintenance and operation. Mm. And the reason for that is, excuse me, the reason for that is simply because of the fact that it is in the best interests of the program to operate in a manner that reduces that conspiracy. Whatever Dowdall's reasons for turning state witness, it meant that a trial already being billed as one of Ireland's biggest ever crime events was set to explode. Exactly what Jerry Hutch made of Dowdall's decision to snitch is anybody's guess. Already behind bars for more than a year, he'd had little else to do other than mull over how he'd ended up back in jail after managing to stay out of it for almost four decades. But up to this point, he must have felt fairly confident that a trial would fail to keep him there. No doubt he'd been assured by his legal team that there was too little evidence to connect him to the Regency. The prosecution would try their best, but the case against him was far from watertight. Then things changed. On the 28th of September 2022, Jonathan Dowdall and his father pleaded guilty to facilitating the murder of David Byrne by making a hotel room available for the hit squad the night before the shooting took place. A few days later, at their sentence hearing on the 3rd of October, it was revealed that Dowdall was being assessed for the witness protection programme and he had made himself available as a witness to testify against Jerry Hutch. The charges of murder against Dowdall were dropped. On the 17th of October, Dowdall, who was still in prison serving his sentence for torture, was brought to the Special Criminal Court where he was jailed for a further four years for his part in the Regency shooting. His dad, Patrick, got another two years. And the very next day, on the 18th of October, Jerry Hutch's murder trial in the Criminal Courts of Justice in Dublin began. But if the monk was nervous, he certainly wasn't showing it. Niall Donald and myself were there for the kickoff. It was a very tense moment. Jerry Hutch really, really shouted out not guilty, actually. And not maybe shouted is the wrong word, but very definitively. I don't know if that's a part of wearing headphones where it's very easy to shout, as we all know, uh, when wearing headphones. As far as we know at this point, and we don't know everything, but it seems very unlikely that there's going to be a moment on those tapes where Jerry Hutch says, yes, I, plan I, commit I, I carried out the Regency Hotel murder. That isn't the case that the state is making. However, they're going to make a broader case of describing how, how these these things all came together. And this is what you see again and again in murder trials where the state will pe pierce together bits of evidence and say, this is how they fit together and they can't fit together any other way. The defence will say, those are isolated pieces of evidence and they don't prove anything in of themselves. So it's going to be a long and, and complex trial, but there will, become, there will come another big day in court, mm. will be the day that Jonathan Dowdle comes in and, and, and acts as a, a witness because he has to act as a live witness. He has to be cross-examined. And I think that would be a, 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 a blockbuster moment. It took 52 days for the three-judge court to hear 140 witnesses, which included eight days straight of Jonathan Dowdall. Evidence included long sections of the 10 hours of secret recordings from a car journey the monk took with Dowdall to the north. 
Other technical evidence included dramatic CCTV footage and 27 National Surveillance Unit officers were called to give eyewitness testimony. There were times it offered a fascinating glimpse into the underworld of Irish crime and one of its most enigmatic figures. But, like most court cases, there were also days upon days when it was deadly dull. Like several other journalists, I sat through a lot of it. Billed as Ireland's gangland trial of the century, there were certainly times when it all felt quite tense. Of course, much of that was down to Sadie Byrne, the mother of murder victim David. For almost every single day of the trial, she sat in the main body of the courtroom with one of her daughters by her side. You couldn't miss her, with bright blonde hair and an oxygen tank feeding a steady stream of air into her nose, she always made sure her presence was felt. About a month into the proceedings, however, she was forced to miss a few days when her mother, Maria Shine, died at the age of 91. The funeral at St Nicholas of Myra Church on Francis Street in the Liberties was huge. A former fruit seller on nearby Thomas Street, Mrs Shine had 13 children, 41 grandchildren, 69 great-grandchildren and 10 great-great-grandchildren. It's quite the family tree. As well as being the grandmother of the Regency Hotel victim David Byrne, Mrs Shine was also grandmother to Fat Freddie Thompson, who's currently serving a life sentence for the murder of Dahi Douglas in 2016, a killing that's been attributed to the Kinahan Hutch feud. Another grandson, David's brother Liam, was named in the High Court as leader of the Byrne organised crime gang, a subsection of the Kinahan organised crime group. He's been living in England since his brother was killed and it's not thought that he returned to Dublin for his grandmother's funeral. Back in the courtroom, sitting alongside Hutch throughout the trial, were his two co-accused, Paul Murphy of Cherry Avenue Swords in Dublin and Jason Bonney of Drumnye Woods, Port Marnock, also in Dublin. Both pleaded not guilty to participating in or contributing to the murder of David Byrne by providing access to motor vehicles on the 5th of February 2016. Unlike Hutch, they were out on bail and arrived at the courts each morning just after 10am. They were often spotted in the cafe together, eating a packed lunch and waiting for the afternoon session to begin. It was clear relations between all three co-accused were good, despite their circumstances. In between court proceedings, they would chat and joke amongst themselves, impervious to the attention they were getting from the main body of the courtroom. And there were lots of staring eyes, not just from the media. Small groups of transition year students were herded in at various times by community guard officers to have a look at just how our justice system works. While students of criminology also often popped in to check out how the trial was progressing. There were also the ordinary citizens who liked to sit in and witness for themselves rather than just read about what was happening each day. One woman I spoke to about halfway through the trial was Breda Clerken, who got a bus from her home village of Newtown Butler in South Fermanagh at 8am. She told me how it was her second time to make the journey and that she'd been quite shocked when she saw Jerry Hutch at first, that he'd changed a lot since all those photographs that are in the newspapers of him were taken. A retired account technician, she'd been fascinated by the world of crime since Joe O'Reilly's appearance on The Late Late Show almost 20 years ago. The Dublin man was later found guilty of killing his wife Rachel at their home in the Knoll, North Dublin, after an exhaustive Garda investigation and sensational murder trial. I read everything now, all about the Kinahan Hutch gangs, Mrs. Clerken told me. And I'll be honest, I feel a little bit of sympathy for Jerry Hutch. I know he was a criminal, but look what the Kinahans have done. They seem to be a whole different level. One thing she was spot on about was how Jerry Hutch has changed. The once cropped jet black hair was now silver grey and waved down to his collar. Issues with his hearing meant he had to wear a pair of headphones throughout the trial to help him listen to what was going on. Known to be brighter than your average criminal, you can be sure he didn't want to miss a thing. From the very start of the trial, it was clear the prosecution had a lot riding on Jonathan Dowdall's testimony. In their opening statements, they experienced how the court would hear that Hutch had told Dowdall he was one of the team that murdered David Byrne. 
setting the tone of the proceedings, in his opening statement, Senior Counsel for the State, Sean Galan, described the Regency attack as performative, targeted and with elements of the militaristic and the macabre. The court heard how 36-year-old David Byrne, a well-known gangland figure, was shot six times to the head, face, stomach, hands and legs. Horrific CCTV footage of his final moments was shown to the court. Also screened was the moment an attack team of six, including a driver, arrived at the Regency Hotel in a silver Ford Transit van around 2.30pm. A young man dressed as a woman and wearing a blonde wig ran in with a second middle-aged man in a flat cap. Firing handguns, they sent people fleeing in panic. Three more men disguised as armed guardie in tactical clothing and carrying AK-47 assault rifles then stormed the building. Byrne was shot in the lobby of the hotel and while he lay dying on the floor, he was once again pumped with bullets. Court cases rarely go through the evidence or sequence of events chronologically, so I'll go through some of the main and most significant bits we learned as the trial wore on. Early on, a surveillance guard had testified that he saw Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowdall meeting convicted IRA member Shane Rowan, who was later caught in County Donegal with three AK-47 assault rifles that were used in the Regency shooting. The court also heard that Hutch's brother Patrick Hutch Sr. was in the same car as Rowan a month after the attack on the 9th of March 2016. That afternoon, the AK-47s were seized from the back of Rowan's car. In mid-November, there was interesting, never heard before evidence about how the Hutch gang operated from Detective Superintendent David Gallagher, who's held various senior roles in the Gardaí, the most recent with the National Drug and Organised Crime Bureau. As a result, he has significant insight into a multitude of criminal organisations and he was asked to outline the Hutch gang's structure. He described it as being made up of intergenerational familial bonds and close family associations, predominantly from the Dublin city centre area. The organisation was less hierarchical than other criminal organisations, he said, and operated a patriarchal system of loyalty based on monetary gain. It was quite a fluid organisation with participants and affiliates working together at times to commit crimes and at other times they worked independently or with other criminal organisations, he said. But since the eruption of the Kinahan Hutch feud in 2015, there'd been a galvanisation of positions within the Hutch organisation. But by far the most explosive evidence during this trial was the evidence gleaned from a tracking and audio device that was fitted to Jonathan Dowdall's Land Cruiser Jeep when he drove Jerry Hutch across the border, just over a month after the Regency attack. On the 7th of March 2016, the two men drove to Straban, County Tyrone, in a bid to get Republicans to mediate in the escalating feud with the Kinahans. Gardy, who had both men under surveillance for some time, had installed the audio recording device inside the vehicle. There was, however, some controversy around this particular evidence, which took up several days of court time and provided one of the most bizarre moments. Somehow, all records from the tracking device were destroyed after Hutch was arrested and charged and before the Regency Hotel murder trial began last October. Hutch's barrister, Brendan Grehan, senior counsel, said the destruction of the records was a real problem and he stated that he did not accept the state's claim that it was done in accordance with the law. The following week, however, the court was informed that the Garda National Cyber Crime Bureau had conducted a fairly extensive search operation during which a securely stored desktop computer that had been listed for destruction had been examined. And there they found a working copy of the recordings in question and it was now available for examination. But then there were questions raised about the legitimacy of the tapes given that the bugged Jeep drove into Northern Ireland for a large part of the journey and how admissible they were in a court of law in the Republic of Ireland. The trial judges, Miss Justice Tara Burns presiding, who sat with Judge Sarah Berkeley and Judge Gronje Malone, ruled that they would listen to the 10 hours of conversation between Hutch and Dowdall that were captured by Gardaí and rule on their admissibility later. 
On the 22nd of November, the court began to listen to the recordings and as my colleague Niall Donald and I observed, if there was one thing that was certain after hearing them, it's that sitting in a car for 10 hours with Jonathan Dowdall must have been an utterly torturous ordeal for the monk. Jonathan Dowdall will give you a pain in the face, <laughs> right? Yeah. He never stops talking. SH1T. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm being stuck in a car with anybody for 10 hours that keeps talking is, is tough. But I mean, you can. it's clear anyway, they definitely didn't know they were being recorded. Definitely not. But I mean, doubt all, like there's bits of it that are important and of interest, but a lot of it is doubt all's just general commentary. And he's a very um, showy person. He's obviously trying to impress Jerry Hutch. Yeah. He's talking about he did this and he did that and he put the heavy on this one and he did that. And, yeah. you know, he's he wouldn't come across as probably the brightest spark. No. Um, but certainly attempting to impress Jerry and keep him. Yeah. And generally, generally irritating. Yeah. Anyway, they start. But there were also important bits, including chats about the notorious former Republican criminal Pierce McCauley, who was jailed in connection with the murder of Garda Jerry McCabe. There was a conversation about effective bomb making and how wrecked Daniel Kinahan looked in photographs taken after the attack that were published in the Sunday World. They talked about how the gang was under huge pressure in the UK and there was a rare embarrassing moment for the monk who told how he was questioned by Gardaí at the airport after flying back into Ireland and declared they were clueless about what really happened at the Regency, going around like headless chickens. And yet there he was being bugged while under surveillance. There was also an illuminating discussion about peace negotiations between the Hutch and Kinahan families, where the monk stated that the hitmen who tried to kill him in Lanzarote and those that shot his brother would have to go. He also explained to Dowdall how it was very hard to get involved where the Kinahans are concerned because it doesn't work. The messenger gets it. Hutch also mentioned three yokes and giving them as a present to the Republicans in the North. According to the prosecution, this part referred to the assault rifles used by the Regency attackers. Dowdall told Hutch at one point, you know what the best move you did, the best thing that happened was the particular yokes that was used. That in itself made some fucking statement. And Hutch agreed, saying, a massive statement. Rather sensationally, the following day's section of tape included criticism of Sinn Féin's leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, where Dowdall complained how she'd failed to go to the funeral of Edward Neddy Hutch. But yous were good enough to use, Gerard, for votes. Yous were good enough to use for money, he moaned. As damning as the recordings were, it was difficult to ignore that the vast majority of them were taped in Northern Ireland. Many suspected they would not be allowed to, be, to have any bearing on the case against the monk. But on the 2nd of December, the judges ruled that the evidence was in fact admissible. The defence team then argued that dropping the murder charges against Jonathan Dowdall was an incredibly powerful incentive for him to give a statement against Hutch which, they said, left it impossible for their client to obtain a fair trial if Dowdall was permitted to give evidence. But the judges ruled that his evidence was also admissible. And on the 12th of December, he took the stand. He got off to a pretty sensational start, declaring to the court that Jerry Hutch had told him that he and another man shot David Byrne at the Regency. Between his statement to the Gardaí and his testimony in court, he stated that he had met Hutch a few days after the attack in the North Dublin Park in Whitehall and that Hutch had confessed that he and Mago Gately had shot David Byrne. He also claimed Hutch had been edgy after the publication of a photo of two of the Regency Raiders in the Sunday World and that he was worried that a lot of innocent people were going to be killed. He asked Dowdall to set up a meeting with the IRA so they could help broker a peace deal. The monks' legal team didn't hold back in their cross-examination, however, accusing Dowdall of being a master manipulator and an opportunistic liar, that he was prepared to lie under oath and that he had a fairly mixed relationship with the truth. It was an exhausting and at times intensely frustrating eight days of evidence. As the recordings had revealed, Dowdall is one of those people who just doesn't know when to shut up. He was also prone to making some seriously ill-judged decisions. 
Take, for instance, the evidence that was included on his final day of cross-examination on the 21st of December. An interview he gave to Joe Duffy's Liveline show on the 9th of March 2016 when he rang in to claim that he was an innocent victim after the guard he raided his house in search of arms and ammunition. Joe, I'm well regarded in the Northern Sea. Okay. I'm not involved in crime. After a short break for Christmas, there were a couple of more weeks of evidence, cross-examination and legal arguments. Finally, in the closing speeches on the 25th of January, the prosecution told the court that Jerry Hutch was one of two gunmen disguised in tactical gear who shot David Byrne in a brutal and callous execution in the midst of the complete carnage of the Regency attack and should be convicted of murder. They insisted that the recordings between himself and Dowdall showed that Hutch was the man in charge. His defence team, however, said that the case against him stood or fell on whether the Special Criminal Court can believe the evidence of a proven and admitted liar and perjurer. On the morning of April 17th, 2023, the crowds gathered once more in the Special Criminal Court for the anxiously awaited judgment in the case which had become as much about the monk's future as Dowdall's. The morning's proceedings were taken up in the three-judge court finding his co-accused Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy both guilty of their roles in facilitating the murder by supplying getaway vehicles. Both defence arguments were utterly dismissed. Bonnie's that his late father William was driving his car as a lie and Murphy's that his taxi had been cloned as ludicrous. A short break for lunch followed before the monk sat to hear his fate. Justice Tara Burns was quick to point out that the state had pigeonholed the legendary criminal as one of the two tack team shooters on the day and not just an organiser of the attack or someone in control of the weapons. She dismissed the evidence of Dowdall as it had been presented to the court uncorroborated by the state. Dowdall's evidence could not be relied upon, the court ruled. And all of a sudden it was all over, with the two words not guilty ringing out across the stunned courtroom. Hutch nodded his approval and was quickly surrounded by his celebratory legal team. The Byrne family made a slow exit out the door, sitting initially outside the court, but quickly gathering and leaving without commenting to the waiting media. Amid dramatic scenes, the monk stood in the foyer of the courts, gazing at the wall of cameras outside. A man of few words, he gave no indication when I asked him what his plans were, but merely smiled and said, I'm going out that door. A week into his 60th year, he finally stepped out into the April sunshine as drivers beeped their horns in approval and passers-by tried to take selfies. With scrums of photographers and cameramen circling him, he grinned impassively at the melee and refused to answer any questions to journalists. And then he was gone, driven off in a taxi back into the heart of his beloved North Inner City, where family and friends welcomed home their godfather. Just like his nephew, Patrick Hutch, who'd also walked free from the Regency murder charges, the monk had achieved the impossible and won back his liberty. In Limerick Prison, Jonathan Dowdall must have heard the news and realised that the game was up and he'd spend the rest of his life running scared from all those he'd betrayed. And 8,000 kilometres away, in the sun-soaked paradise of Dubai, others were watching too and weighing up what the monk's victory meant. Lightning rarely strikes twice, let alone three times. And while the fate of Christy Kinahan and his sons Daniel and Christopher Jr. has yet to be decided, the writing is literally on the wanted posters where a $5 million reward tempts all who know them. The story of the Regency Hotel and the bitter feud between two families is not over yet, but who could have guessed such dramatic final scenes would play out on the streets of Dublin in the close of one chapter? What lies ahead is more than any good scriptwriter could imagine, and a sure sign that truth is often stranger than fiction.
The Monk is a four-part crime world long read produced by Ian Mullaney and read by me, Nicola Talent. Crime World is a podcast from sundayworld.com.